Thank you, Cody. Thank you, choir, for that beautiful piece. And as we approach this time of worship, this week I was thinking about something that happened in our family this past week about, well, exactly 16 years ago, about this past week, it came time to take our firstborn child, Daniel, home from the hospital. And we had been, it was a beautiful day like today, and I remember that I went out to the car at the Martha Jefferson Hospital to pull up into the breezeway and the, drive, the circular drive while the nursing staff put Michelle in a wheelchair as she carried Daniel down the elevator out to the breezeway. There, you know, the nurses checked the car to make sure the car seat was installed properly, but it was because we had already gone by the fire department to let them check it. We had read every book on parenting there was. I take that back. Michelle had read every book and had briefed me. So they put Daniel in his car seat, and the nurses said, um, hugged Michelle and said, all right, see y'all later. And we, I was like, wait a minute. You're just going to let us take him? I mean, we don't know what we're doing. You just let people drive away with babies? And they said, well, there is a home visit scheduled a week from today where a nurse will come into your home and just double check. They'll weigh him and check and make sure everything's going okay. I was like, a week? Well, a week later it came, and she said everything looks okay. He was, you know, had gained weight or whatever he was supposed to do. And thanks to, um, you know, 98% Michelle's effort and 2% mine probably, um, he was healthy and happy at a week. And, and deep down we were both kind of excited that we could keep this baby alive for a week. <laughs> I say that to say, you know, mothers do such a valuable job, do they not? And in this passage, we look at nurturing from men to each other, but also mothers and grandmothers are mentioned specifically, um, it, particularly in the, in the family of faith. You, you do such important work. Maybe you have heard of Tony Campolo, who, was, who is a sociologist, but he's famous for being an, a, an American Baptist preacher. He's a professor in, at a college in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and he has traveled the world over as an evangelist. Okay, so he has preached in, probably on just about every confident, con, uh, um, con, continent. I said confident, sorry. Every continent. And, and, and known the world over. Sometimes his wife would travel with him. She, they had chosen in their family because of his traveling schedule and teaching and preaching schedule. She stayed home to rear their two children, and sometimes she would go with him, and she would find herself at a meal or at a reception with all of these people who were, you know, doctors, lawyers, and Indian chiefs. You know, they'd go to other countries, and then they'd meet leaders. You know, they would just meet these, these famous people, and she began to feel a little uneasy, saying, well, I'm a stay-at-home mom. And so... She told this to Tony. Her name was Peggy. Peggy told it to Tony and said, you know, sometimes I feel uneasy. And he's like, you shouldn't. We've decided, you know, we're in this together. And, and he said, you know, you just need to come up with just say, this is what I do. And just boom. And so she thought about it, and she did. And so not too long later, they were at one of these fancy receptions, and an attorney turned to Peggy and said, now what do you do for a living? Let me write down what she, I wrote down what she wrote so I could get it straight. What do you do for a living? She said, I am nurturing two homo sapiens into, dominant, into the dominant values of the Judeo-Christian tradition in order that they might become instruments for the transformation of the social order into the kind of eschatological utopia God envisioned from the beginning of time. <laughs> the attorney said, oh, I'm just a lawyer. <laughs> Whether you stay home to rear your children or whether you work full-time or work part-time whether you've just adopted your neighbor's kids or maybe someone in your family officially or unofficially you're doing important work and nurturing um, and it, it's such important work that I think you'll see as we sh hear from Paul here that really all of us are called to do among one another particularly in a family of faith with that in mind let's 
pray together. Gracious God, for this moment, we're thankful for this day, for this time that we have together. May the words of my mouth, may the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And all God's children said, amen. The passage that Cody read is from 2 Timothy. It is one of the, in the New Testament, one of the things called the pastoral epistles. And what that is, um, these are letters that Paul wrote. They're attributed to him, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. And, and if you look at particularly 1 and 2 Timothy, they're, they're very different. 1 Timothy is almost like this is, these are your marching orders. This is what the church is to look like. Um, here is a pattern of governance, and here's what I want you to do. And it describes different roles in the church and what to do. And so it's, it's kind of like marching orders, like I just mentioned. But 2 Timothy, if you read it, and you heard just the first seven verses, but 2 Timothy, in, in a sense, reads more like a pastoral letter. 2 Timothy reads kind of like a time of encouragement. 2 Timothy reads almost like a last will and testament. Because you see, if we think about the person who wrote this letter, Paul, we recognize that he had come a long way. He died probably between the years 64 and 68 AD. Basically, he was imprisoned. We know when this letter was wrote. It alludes to it later in the letter. He was imprisoned. Paul had had probably a 25-year ministry after he met Jesus Christ. And if you look just in the New Testament evidence with just the names of the churches that he had founded, if you look at those, he founded at least 14 churches in his 25 years. Now, most scholars would say there are probably a lot of other churches that aren't mentioned by name. But if you look just through Acts and through the New Testament, he founded 14 churches. If you listen to the trajectory of the missionary journeys that he went on, he traveled over 10,000 miles in that 25-year career sharing the gospel, sharing the good news. He had come a long way. But you know where he was when he wrote this letter? He was in prison in Rome. Some think this might have been the last thing that he wrote. Some think this was his last hurrah. And you know, I'm, I'm reminded of, of a saying I heard as a college student that never has gone away from me, um, and it's this. And the way I heard it was this. Two men looked through prison bars. One saw mud, the other stars. And I had this image of two people behind the bars, one looking down at the ground, one looking up to the heavens. Paul writes this from prison, and he writes with what in his heart? Gratitude. I thank God for you, Timothy. I thank God for you. Paul has traveled 10,000 miles. He's founded 14 churches or more. He has run his race. And now he recognizes it is time to pass the baton. You know? When I was in education and youth ministry, after six and a half years, I began to sense that God was changing my calling somewhat. And I didn't know what to, to be honest. I had taken a few classes at the University of Virginia in, in the Ph.D. program, Higher Education Administration, basically a long bunch of words that I was kind of thinking that perhaps God was calling me to do administration at a church-related college, like a UC or something. And so I thought, I need to talk to people who do this as their ministry. And so I thought of, the, the first person I thought of was my college professor who viewed, be, I mean, excuse me, my college president who viewed that college presidency as his calling in life. And I asked him about that career, and he said, you know, I recognize in this institution it's like running a relay race. He said, people have run before me faithfully, and then they stepped off the track, they caught their breath, and they cheered me on. And he said, now I recognize I've got the baton, and I'm running with all that I have, and one day I'll step off the track, I'll catch my breath, and I'll cheer someone else on. That's what Paul's doing here. Paul is cheering Timothy on, and he says a couple of things to him that I think all of us need to hear. He says, Timothy, I remember you in my prayers. Now, it's, it's different to remember someone and to remember them in your prayers. That's two different things, is it not? 
I wonder how many people in your life do you rub shoulders with every day that it's so easy to remember at a, at a traffic light or when something comes on the TV or something comes on the radio, you remember them. But are we committed to remembering one another in our prayers? Lifting up those challenges of the people around us. Thinking about their family situations or their work situations or school or whatever. Um, Timothy says, I mean, excuse me, Paul says, Timothy, I remember you in my prayers. Last night, there was the honors program at the Williamsburg Independent School. And Dr. Couch, who is, I, I don't consider him new, but he's the, the first year superintendent, gave a brief reflection for the students and said uh, he wanted to talk about perseverance, which is very appropriate. And, and at a certain point in the message, he said, in, a, in the very brief message, he said, um, humility. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is thinking of yourself less often. And I'd heard that definition before, probably you have too. Not thinking of yourself less as in, oh, poor me, woe me, you know, whatever. Thinking of yourself less often. This is what Paul's doing. Not focus on the fact that after this great career in ministry, he wrote 28% of the New Testament. Not, woe is me, I'm in prison. Timothy, I remember you in my prayers. So I want to encourage you to, to, to ask the Lord, who are those people in your life that you can be remembering in your prayers? And then secondly, Paul says to Timothy, I give thanks for the faith that was in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice before her. Um, and, and we saw the mother mentioned by name in Acts chapter 16. She was a Jewish lady who was a Christian convert. And, and what I think that tells me is we need to remember from whence we've come. We need to celebrate and remember those people who have testified before us, whether they be individual people in our families or whether they be um, people that were our neighbors or people in our churches. We need to remember those um, who helped pass the faith on to us. And we need to recognize that just as the faith has been shared with us, it is our job, our task, our privilege, our responsibility to pass it on to someone else. This can happen in the family like it did with Timothy. It can happen in our churches and in our communities. It can happen in our neighborhoods. Paul said, Timothy, I give thanks for your mother and your grandmother and the faith that lived in them. And we recognize that Timothy was a recipient of that. And he ended up passing the faith on. And then the final thing that Paul said in these verses, because later in 2 Timothy we see that Paul encourages Timothy to be bold in his witness and to always cling to the Lord and to always remember Jesus Christ. But he says, first, here, rekindle the flame. Rekindle the faith in your life. Have you ever been out in the woods and made a campfire and it all of a sudden got to be time to go to bed, and what do you do with the coals? You spread them out. If you pile them up together, they're going to stay hot a lot longer. What do you do? You spread them out. I wonder, maybe coming to a place like this is how you can rekindle the flame of faith. Maybe being around other believers or, or lifting up others in prayer, or studying, holy, studying Holy Scripture. Maybe that's the way that we are to rekindle the faith. Um, Paul says, Timothy, rekindle this faith that is in you. I try each week to keep up with the news, no matter what's going on. And sometimes, as you know, it's harder than others to want to keep up with the news. But on Sunday morning, I don't read the news I read one article. I've done this for years. I read it online. I don't subscribe to this newspaper. But there is, a, um, there is a segment every Sunday morning in the New York Times called the Sunday Morning Routine. And what they do is they pick some prominent New Yorker and they talk about what they do on their Sunday. It's very interesting because it's not a religious piece unless the person happens to be a committed Christian. Um, they've... they've highlighted rabbis, they've highlighted people of other faiths, um, Christians every now and then. And, and this morning, they highlighted a sister, Sister Paulette um, Lomonico. 
And I was moved by this piece because, like I said, it's not a religious piece ever until a Christian is highlighted on their Sunday. And I wanted to share that with you as an encouragement. Um, I changed this today at the last minute to share with you about Paulette Lamonico. She is the chief executive of the Good Shepherd Services, which is a group, nonprofit, religiously based Catholic, designed to fill in the needs of, of um, people who fall b between the cracks. And so their ministry is to children and to youth and to parents. And so as the executive director of Good Shepherd's um, Services, um, Sister Paulette, that's what I'll call her, Sister Paulette, um, manages 1,300 workers who minister to 30,000 children in New York City, youth and adults and families. They do everything from after-school tutoring to career preparedness to family counseling to financial planning, you name it. And so she, today, they, des they described in the paper what, you know, what her job was and that, and you're like, oh, okay. Now tell us about your typical Sunday. And here's what she does. She rises and whatever sister, she lives with three other sisters in a Catholic um, off a church there in New York. And whoever, of course, you know, whoever gets up first drinks the coffee, makes the coffee. But then, she said, I spend an hour in prayer and praise every day. It was interesting what she did. She looks online at a website. I thought that's kind of interesting for a 73-year-old nun every day doing a devotion off a website. And she reads the Catholic liturgy that millions of other people read every single day and have for a couple of hundred years. And she spends an hour praying to God. She spends an hour praying for the families that she knows that she touches. She spends an hour every day um, reflecting on the Holy Scriptures. She spends an hour praying for the staff that she ministers with. She spends an hour every single morning. Um, she said, this helps me connect with the Lord. This helps me to remember the mission that I've been called upon to do. This helps me remember the needs of those around me. An hour every single morning. You know what I would say that is? Rekindling the flame. Reigniting, I think, is the translation that, that Cody read from. Restarting, rekindling, warming up the flame. You know, today our culture has reminded us of the great value of those mothers who have nurtured us in our lives. But in this scripture, we recognize that we're called upon by the Lord to nurture one another, to encourage one another. And we see in Paul's example that he lifted up Timothy in prayer. And he reminded Timothy to remember those people who had demonstrated the faith for him. And he encouraged Timothy to rekindle the flame. As we think about our families, as we think about our lives... You know, there are probably 150 ways in this room to do that. Won't you this week take seriously this admonition from Paul? As he didn't focus on the fact that he was sitting in a jail cell after this long ministry, not any woe was me, but gratitude for his relationship with Timothy, gratitude for the way that the Lord has worked in his life, gratitude for this ministry he was called upon to do. And so he lifted him up in prayer. What would that look like this week in your life? And, and, and what if this week we gave thanks for those people who've demonstrated the faith to us, like Lois and Eunice did for Timothy? And then what if this week we committed ourselves to rekindling the flame, this faith that was, that, that, that was, that was in Timothy's life that had been recognized by the church in the laying over and on of hands? What would that look like in your life this week? You know, today, say thank you to someone who has nurtured you. Say thank you to the Lord for those who've nurtured you that aren't here today. Um, for those people play a, have played a significant role. But today as well, ask the Lord, to whom am I to share this faith? Who am I to nurture and invest in? Who am I to pray for? Whose faith needs rekindling? You know, that is good news from this little book, the second letter to Timothy. Good news for us today indeed. Please pray with me.
Gracious God, I thank you for all those who are gathered here today. We recognize that you and your spirit are at work in each life. If we think about the families that we reside in and the communities where we live, the schools to which we go and the places we work, the neighbors we have, we, we recognize that you have given us such great opportunity to be a witness. We recognize in our own lives that there are places where we need to rekindle the flame. We need to look to you and to your people, to your scriptures. We need to turn toward a worshiping of you. We need to make space and a place for your guidance in our lives. Lord, we recognize in this world so many people need guidance and a friend. So many people don't know your good news. And we recognize that you've called us together in this place at this time to be your church. So I pray, Lord, in thanksgiving for those who have set good examples. Lord, I pray for those right now who are receiving good examples even now. And I pray, Lord, that you would equip each one of us in the way that you would call us individually to do to share your good news in our families, among our neighbors, in the places where you've called us to live. And I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn of commitment today is hymn number 593, Where He Leads Me. The interesting thing is, if you grew up in a Baptist church like I did, I thought that the most valuable calling was to the missionary who was sent overseas to learn a new language and to live under different conditions than I lived in. That's the highest calling. And then, you know, after that you had, you know, maybe pastors and evangelists and deacons and Sunday school teachers and all that other kind of stuff. The older I've gotten, the more I've realized the highest calling is the one you're sitting in right now. To be the person God is calling you to be in your family, among your friends, to walk more faithfully today, right here, right now. And so as we sing where he leads me, perhaps you've sensed God leading you in some particular way. Um, if you need to respond to that in a public way, I'll be here to receive you. Um, but let's sing, sing this as a hymn of commitment. Um, let's stand and sing where he leads me. The psalmist has said... I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Um, I hope that you feel that way today. It's such a privilege to worship in this place. I want to just remind you of different opportunities of service and fellowship in our church. You've heard about these this morning in the announcements, but I encourage you to look online and on our MailChimp and in the bulletin. Many ways to get involved and connect and serve and study. I also want to remind you, if you want to leave a brief note for Kenya, Kathy Bird takes a picture of each person who's baptized, and there's some markers and things. We'll have this here for a couple of weeks, so if you want to just write a scripture or an encouraging word, do that. And finally, at each of the three exits, we have a carnation for each of our ladies. Just a symbol thanking you for all of the nurturing that you do um, among us and in your families. Um, and in this community. So I hope that you'll take a moment to um, receive that gift in appreciation from our church. Um, please bow for our benediction. Heavenly Father, I ask that you bless this group of believers. I recognize so many gifts and such beauty in these lives, such joy in these faces and enthusiasm, so many talents and abilities. Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts to your movement. I pray that you would bless each one as they leave this place today. I pray that you would enable them to go out and serve you. I pray that we would be faithful witnesses. I pray that we would live lives of gratitude and bless the world in your name and for your sake. And I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.